Gehazi. Gehazi, who proved himself untrustworthy by his conduct on the previous occasion, again aroused the ire of the prophet. When he disregarded an order not to accept money from Naaman, the Syrian captain who Elisha had cured of a skin disease, but instead tried to keep the money for himself, he did not succeed in deceiving the prophet. On his return from Naaman, he found Elisha occupied with the study of the chapter in the Mishnah Shabbat, which deals with the eight reptiles. The prophet Elisha greeted him with a rebuke. You villain! The time has come for me to be rewarded for the study of the Mishnah about the eight reptiles. May my reward be that the disease of Naaman afflict you and your descendants forever. Scarcely had these words escaped his lips when he saw the leprosy come out on Gehazi's face. Gehazi deserved the punishment on account of his low character. He was sensual and envious, and he did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. His unworthy qualities were displayed in his conduct toward the Shunammite and toward the disciples of Elisha. When the beautiful Shunammite came to the prophet in her grief over the death of her child, Gehazi took her passionately in his arms under the pretext of diverting her from the prophet, who he said was busy. As for the other disciples of Elisha, he endeavored to keep them away from the house. He was in the habit of standing outside the door. This induced many to turn away and go home, for they reasoned that, if the house was not full to overflowing, Gehazi would not be standing outside. Only after Gehazi's dismissal did the disciples of Elisha increase marvelously. That Gehazi had no faith in the resurrection of the dead is shown by his incredulity regarding the child of the Shunammite. In spite of all these faults, Elisha regretted that he had cast off his disciple, who was a great scholar in the law, especially as Gehazi abandoned himself to a sinful life after leaving the prophet. By means of magnetism, he made the golden calves at Bethel float in the air. And by this means, many were brought to believe in the divinity of these idols. Moreover, he engraved the great and awful name of the Lord in their mouth. Thus they were enabled to speak, and they spoke the same words God had proclaimed from Sinai. I am the Lord your God. You will have no other gods before me. So Elisha went to Damascus to lead Gehazi back to the paths of righteousness. But Gehazi remained impenitent and said, It was from you that I learned that there is no hope for him who not only sins, but also induces others to sin. So Gehazi died without having done anything to atone for his transgressions, which were so great that he is one of the few Jews who have no share in paradise. His children did inherit his leprosy. He and his three sons are the four leprous men who informed the king of Israel of the flight of the Syrian host. Elisha's excessive severity towards his servant Gehazi and toward the mocking boys of Jericho who made fun of his bald head and he cursed with killer bears did not go unpunished. He had to endure two periods of disease, and the third sickness caused his death. He is the first known in history who survived a sickness. Before him, death had been the inevitable companion of disease. A great miracle marked the end of a life rich in miraculous deeds. A dead man was revived by the touch of Elisha's casket. He was a worthy character, Willem, the husband of Huldah the prophetess, a man of noble descent, who had led a life of loving kindness. He was in the habit of going out of the city daily bearing a pitcher of water, from which he gave every traveler drink, a good deed that received double reward. His wife became a prophetess, and when he died his funeral was attended by a large concourse of people, but it was disturbed by the invasion of the Arameans. He was given new life by contact with the bones of Elisha. He lived to have a son, Hanamel by name. The death of Elisha was a great misfortune for the Israelites. So long as he was alive, no Aramean troops entered Palestine. The first invasion by them happened on the day of his burial. The Flight of Jonah 
among the many thousands of disciples Elisha gathered about him during his sixty years of activity, the most prominent was the prophet Jonah. While the master was still alive, Jonah was charged with the important mission of anointing Jehu king. The next task laid on him was to proclaim their destruction to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The doom did not come to pass, because they repented of their wrongdoing, and God showed mercy on them. So, among the Israelites, Jonah was therefore known as the false prophet. Then, when he was sent to Nineveh to prophesy the downfall of the city, he reflected, I know for a certainty that the heathen will do penance, the threatened punishment will not be executed, and among the heathen too, I will gain the reputation of being a false prophet. To escape this disgrace, he decided to live on the sea, where there would be no one to deliver prophecies to, prophecies that would never be fulfilled. On his arrival at Joppa, there was no vessel in port. Then, God caused a storm to arise, and it carried a ship back to Joppa, which had just made a two days' journey away from the harbor. The prophet interpreted this chance to mean that God approved his plan. He was so rejoiced at the opportunity to leave land that he paid the whole amount for the entire cargo in advance, no less a sum than 4,000 gold denarii. After a day's sailing, a terrific storm broke loose. Amazingly, it injured no ship but Jonah's. Thus he was taught the lesson that God is the Lord over heaven, earth, and sea, and man can hide nowhere. On the same ship were representatives of the seventy nations of the earth, each with his peculiar idols. They all resolved to entreat their gods for help, and the god who helped would be recognized and worshipped as the only one true god. But help came from none of them. Then it was that the captain of the vessel approached Jonah where he lay asleep and said to him, We are tossed between life and death, and you lie here asleep? What nation do you belong to? I am a Hebrew, replied Jonah. I have heard, said the captain, that the God of the Hebrews is the most powerful. Cry to him for help. Perhaps he will perform such miracles for us as he did in the days of old for the Jews at the Red Sea. But Jonah confessed to the captain that it was he himself that was to blame for the whole misfortune, because he was running away from God's command and he besought the captain to cast him overboard and appease the storm. The other passengers refused to consent to so cruel an act, but by lottery they also decided against Jonah. Still, they tried to save the ship by throwing the cargo overboard. Their efforts were in vain. Then they placed Jonah at the side of the vessel and said, O Lord of the world, reckon this not as innocent blood, and he himself bids us to throw him into the sea. Even then they could not make up their minds to let him down. First they immersed him up to his knees in the water, and the storm ceased. They drew him back into the vessel, and again the storm raged in its old fury. Two more trials were made. They lowered him into the water up to his navel, and raised him out of the depths when the storm was assuaged. Again, when the storm broke out anew, they lowered him to his neck, and again took him back into the vessel when the wind subsided. But finally the renewed rage of the storm convinced them that their danger was due to Jonah's transgressions, and they abandoned him to his fate. He was thrown into the water, and on that instant the sea grew calm. Jonah in the Whale At the creation of the world, God made a fish intended to harbor Jonah. He was so large that the prophet was as comfortable inside him as in a spacious synagogue. The eyes of the fish served Jonah as windows, and besides there was a diamond, which shone as brilliantly as the sun at midday, so that Jonah could see all things in the sea down to its very bottom. It is a law that when their time has come, all fish of the sea must take themselves to Levithian and let the monster devour them. The life term of Jonah's fish was about to expire, and the fish warned Jonah of what was to happen. Later, when he, with Jonah in his belly, came to Levithian, the prophet said to the monster, It was because of you I came here. It was meant for me to know where you live, for it is my appointed task to capture you in the life to come and slaughter you for the table of the just and pious. 
When Levithian observed the sign of the covenant on Jonah's body, he fled afraid, and Jonah and the fish were saved. To show his gratitude, the fish carried Jonah wherever there was a sight to be seen. He showed him the river from which the ocean flows, showed him the spot at which the Israelites crossed the Red Sea, showed him Gehenna and Sheol, and many other mysterious and wonderful places. Three days Jonah spent in the belly of the fish, and still he felt so comfortable that he did not think of asking God to change his condition. But God sent a female fish big with 365,000 little fish to Jonah's fish to demand the surrender of the prophet, or else she would swallow both him and the guest he harbored. The message was received with incredulity, and Levithian had to come and testify as to its truth. He himself had heard God dispatch the female fish on her errand. So it came about that Jonah was transferred to another fish. His new quarters, which he had to share with all the little fish, were far from comfortable, and from the bottom of his heart a prayer for deliverance arose to God. The last words of his long petition were, I will do as you commanded. Then God made the fish spit Jonah out. He was thrown 965 parasangs from the fish and landed on dry land. These miracles induced the ship's crew to abandon idolatry, and they all became pious converts in Jerusalem. The Repentance of Nineveh Jonah went straight to Nineveh the monster city covering 40 square parasangs and containing a million and a half people. Yet he lost no time in proclaiming their destruction. The voice of the prophet was so sonorous that it reached every corner of the great city, and all who heard his words resolved to turn aside from their ungodly ways. At the head of the penitents was King Osnapper of Assyria. He descended from his throne, removed his crown, threw ashes on his head, took off his purple garments and rolled about in the dust of the highways. In all the streets, royal heralds proclaimed the king's decree, bidding the inhabitants to fast three days, wear sackcloth, and supplicate God with tears and prayers to avert the threatened doom. The people of Nineveh compelled God's mercy to descend on them. They held their infants heavenward, and amid streaming tears they cried, For the sake of these innocent babes, hear our prayers. The young of their cattle they separated from the mother beasts. The young were left in the stable, the old were put outside. So, separated from one another, the young and the old began to bellow loudly. Then the Ninevites cried, If you will not have mercy on us, we will not have mercy on these beasts. The penance of the Ninevites did not stop at fasting and praying. Their deeds showed that they had determined to lead a better life. If a man had usurped another's property, he sought to make amends. Some went so far as to destroy their palaces in order to be able to give back a single brick to the rightful owner. Of their own accord, others appeared before the courts of justice and confessed their secret crimes and sins, known to no one but themselves, and declared themselves ready to submit to well-merited punishment, even if it was death. One incident from that time illustrates the contrition of the Ninevites. A man found a treasure in a vacant lot he had acquired from his neighbor. Both buyer and seller refused to assume possession of the treasure. The seller insisted that the sale of the lot carried with it the sale of all it contained. The buyer held that he had bought the ground, not the treasure buried in it. Neither rested satisfied until the judge succeeded in finding out who had hidden the treasure in the first place and where his heirs were and the joy of the two was great when they could deliver the treasure to its legitimate owners. Seeing that the Ninevites had undergone a real change of heart, God took mercy on them and pardoned them. While Jonah was again angry that the destruction did not come, he also felt encouraged to plead for himself with God, that he forgive him for his flight. God said, You were mindful of my honor. The prophet had not wanted to appear a liar, so that men's trust in God might not be shaken. And for this reason you took to the sea. Therefore I dealt mercifully with you and rescued you from the bowels of Sheol. His time in the fish could not easily be forgotten, nor did it remain without any visible consequences. The intense heat in the belly of the fish had consumed his garments, made his hair fall out, 
and he was plagued by swarms of insects. To afford Jonah protection, God caused a kikion to grow up. When he opened his eyes one morning, he saw a plant with 275 leaves, each leaf measuring more than a span, so it afforded relief from the heat of the sun. But when the sun withered the leaves, Jonah was again annoyed by insects and felt bad the plant had withered. He began to weep and wish for death to release him from his troubles. But God led him to the plant and showed him what lesson he might learn from it, how, though he had not labored for the plant, he had the use of it. Then he realized his wrong in wanting God to be relentless towards Nineveh, which, like the plant, grew its many inhabitants without any help from him, and he should be happy it was saved, rather than worry that his reputation as a prophet suffered. Jonah prostrated himself and said, O God, guide the world according to your goodness. God was gracious to the people of Nineveh so long as they continued worthy of his loving kindness, but at the end of forty days they departed from the path of piety and became more sinful than ever. Then the punishment threatened by Jonah overtook them, and they were swallowed up by the earth. Jonah's suffering in the watery abyss had been so severe that by way of compensation God exempted him from death. He was permitted to enter paradise alive. Like Jonah, his wife was known far and wide for her piety. She had gained fame particularly through her pilgrimage to Jerusalem, a duty which, by reason of her sex, she was not obliged to fulfill. On one of these pilgrimages it happened that the prophetical spirit first descended on Jonah. Joash When the prophet Jonah, at the request of his master Elisha, anointed Jehu king over Israel, he poured the oil out of a pitcher, not out of a horn, to indicate that the dynasty of Jehu would not occupy the throne long. At first, Jehu, though a somewhat foolish king, was at least pious, but he abandoned his God-fearing ways the moment he saw the document bearing the signature of the prophet Ahijah of Shiloh, in which the signers agreed to pay implicit obedience to Jeroboam. The king took this as evidence that the prophet had approved the worship of the golden calves. So it came to pass that Jehu, the enemy of Baal worship, did nothing to oppose the idolatry established by Jeroboam at Bethel. The successors of Jehu were no better. On the contrary, they were worse. And therefore in the fifth generation an end was put to the dynasty by the hand of an assassin. The kings of Judah were no different from those in the north. Ahaziah, who Jehu killed, was a shameless sinner. He had the name of God expurged from every passage in which it occurred in the Holy Scriptures, and names of idols inserted in its place. After the death of Ahaziah came the reign of terror under the queen Athaliah, when God took payment from the house of David for his part in the connection with the extermination at Nob. The only member of the house of David to remain after the sword of Athaliah had raged was Joash, the child kept in hiding in the Holy of Holies in the temple. Later, Jehoiada installed him as king of Judah. The very crown worn by the rulers of the house of David testified to the legitimacy of Joash, for it possessed the peculiarity of fitting no one but the rightful successors to David. At the suggestion of Jehoiada, King Joash undertook the restoration of the temple. The work was completed so efficiently that one who was living at the time the temple was erected by Solomon, when he was young, could live to see the new structure shortly before his death. This good fortune befell Joiada himself, commander-in-chief of the army under Solomon. So long as Joash continued under the mentoring of Jehoiada, he was a pious king. But when Joiada departed this life, the courtiers came to Joash, who was hidden in the temple when he was young, and flattered him. If you were not a god, you would not have been able to live for six years in the Holy of Holies, a spot which even the high priest can only enter once a year. The king enjoyed their flattery and permitted the people to pay him divine homage. But when the folly of the king prompted him to go so far as to set up an idol in the temple, Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, stood in the entrance and barring the way said, You will not do it so long as I live. High priest, 
prophet and judge though Zechariah was, and son-in-law of Joash to boot, the king still did not shrink from having him killed. Nor was he deterred by the fact that it happened on a day of atonement which fell on the Sabbath. The innocent blood did not remain unavenged. For 252 years it did not stop seething and pulsating, until finally Nebu Zararadan, captain of Nebuchadnezzar's guard, ordered a great slaughter of the Judeans to avenge the death of Zechariah. Joash himself, the murderer of Zechariah, met with an evil end. He fell into the hands of the Syrians, and they abused him in their barbarous, immoral way. Before he could recover from the sufferings inflicted on him, his servants killed him. Amaziah, the son and successor of Joash, in many respects resembled his father. At the beginning of his reign he was God-fearing, but when through the aid of God he had a brilliant victory over the Edomites, he knew no better way of manifesting his gratitude than to establish the idol worshipped by his conquered enemies in Jerusalem. To ensure his chastisement, God inspired Amaziah with the idea of provoking a war with Joash, the ruler of the northern kingdom. Amaziah demanded that Joash must either recognize the reign of the southern realm voluntarily or let the fate of battle decide the question. At first, Joash tried to change Amaziah's mind by a parable reminding him of the fate of Shechem, which the sons of Jacob destroyed for the violence done to their sister Dinah. Amaziah refused to be warned. He persisted in his challenge, and a war ensued. The fortune of battle went against Amaziah. He suffered defeat, and later he was tortured to death by his own subjects. Three Great Prophets The reign of Uzziah, who for a little while occupied the throne during his father Amaziah's lifetime, is notable particularly because it marks the beginning of the activity of three of the prophets, Hosea, Amos, and Isaiah. The oldest of the three was Hosea, the son of the prophet and prince Beri, the Beri who was later carried away captive by Tiglath-Peleser, the king of Assyria. Of Beri's prophecies we have but two verses, preserved for us by Isaiah. The peculiar marriage contracted by Hosea at the command of God himself was not without good reason. When God spoke to the prophet about the sins of Israel, expecting him to defend or excuse his people, Hosea said severely, O Lord of the world, the universe is yours. In place of Israel, choose another as your people from among the nations of the earth. To make the true relationship between God and Israel known to the prophet, he was commanded to take to wife a woman with a dubious past. After she had borne him several children, God suddenly put the question to him, Why do you not follow the example of your teacher Moses, who denied himself the joys of family life after his call to prophecy? Hosea replied, I can neither send my wife away nor divorce her, for she has borne me children. If now, said God, you have a wife of whose honesty you are so uncertain that you cannot even be sure that her children are yours, and yet you cannot separate from her, how then can I separate myself from Israel, from my children, the children of my elect, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Hosea entreated God to pardon him. But God said, It would be better if you prayed for the welfare of Israel, for because of you I have issued three fateful decrees against them. Hosea prayed as he was bidden, and his prayer averted the impending threefold doom. Hosea died at Babylon, at a time when a journey from there to Palestine was beset with many perils. Desirous of having his earthly remains rest in sacred ground, he requested before his death that his casket be loaded on a camel, and the camel be permitted to make its way as it would. Where it stopped, there his body was to be buried. As he commanded, so it was done. Without a single mishap, the camel arrived at Safed. In the Jewish cemetery of the town, it stood still, and there Hosea was buried in the presence of a large concourse. The prophetical activity of Amos commenced after Hosea's had closed, and before Isaiah's began. Though he had an impediment in his speech, he obeyed the call of God and went to Bethel to proclaim to the sinful inhabitants 
the divine message with which he had been charged. The denunciation of the priest Amaziah of Bethel, who informed against the prophet before King Jeroboam of Israel, did him no harm, for the king, idolater though he was, had profound respect for Amos. He said to himself, God forbid I should think the prophet guilty of being a traitor, and if he were, it would surely be at the bidding of God. For this pious disposition, Jeroboam was rewarded. Never had the northern kingdom attained such power as under him. However, the fearlessness of Amos finally caused his death. King Uzziah inflicted a mortal blow on his forehead with a red-hot iron. Two years after Amos ceased to prophesy, Isaiah was favored with his first divine communication. It was the day on which King Uzziah, blinded by success and prosperity, arrogated to himself the privileges of the priesthood. He tried to offer sacrifices on the altar, and when the high priest Azariah ventured to restrain him, he threatened to slay him and any priest sympathizing with him unless they kept silent. Suddenly, the earth quaked so violently that a great breach was torn in the temple, through which a brilliant ray of sunlight pierced, falling on the forehead of the king and causing leprosy to break out on him. Nor was that all the damage done by the earthquake. On the west side of Jerusalem, half of the mountain was split off and hurled to the east into a road at a distance of four stadia. And not only heaven and earth were outraged by Uzziah's atrocity and sought to annihilate him, even the angels of fire, the seraphim, were on the point of descending and consuming him, when a voice from on high proclaimed that the punishment appointed for Uzziah was unlike that meted out to Korah and his company, despite the similarities of their crimes. When Isaiah beheld the throne of God on this memorable day, he was very frightened and he reproached himself for not having tried to turn the king away from his impious desire. Enthralled, he heard the hymns of the praise sung by the angels, and lost in admiration, he failed to join his voice with theirs. Woe is me, he cried out, that I was silent. Woe is me that I did not join the chorus of angels praising God. Had I done it, I too, like the angels, would have become immortal seeing I was permitted to look on sights which had brought death to other men. Then he began to excuse himself. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. At once resounded the voice of God in rebuke. Of yourself you are master, and of yourself you may say what you choose. But who gave you the right to calumniate my children and call them? a people of unclean lips. And Isaiah heard God bid one of the seraphim touch his lips with a live coal as a punishment for having slandered Israel. Though the coal was so hot that the seraph needed tongs to hold the coal which he had taken from the altar, the prophet escaped unscathed. But he learned the lesson, that it was his duty to defend Israel, not condemn him. From then on, the championship of his people was the mainspring of the prophet's activity, and he was rewarded by having more revelations concerning Israel and the other nations given to him than any other prophet before or after. Moreover, God designated Isaiah to be the prophet of consolation. Thus it happened that the very Isaiah, whose early prophecies foretold the exile and destruction of the temple, later described and proclaimed in plainer terms than any other prophet, the brilliant destiny in store for Israel. The Two Kingdoms Chastised Afflicted with leprosy, Uzziah was unfit to reign as king, so Jotham administered the affairs of Judah for twenty-five years before the death of his father. Jotham possessed so much piety that his virtues, added to those of two other very pious men, sufficed to atone for all the sins of the whole of mankind, from the hour of creation until the end of all time. Ahaz, the son of Jotham, was very unlike him. From first to last, he was a sinner. He abolished the true worship of God, disregarded the study of the Torah, set up an idol in the upper room of the temple, and disregarded the Jewish laws of marriage. His transgressions are even less pardonable because he sinned against God knowing his grandeur and power 
as appears from his reply to the prophet. Isaiah said to him, Ask a sign of God, as, for instance, that the dead should arise, Korah come up from Sheol, or Elijah descend from heaven. The king's answer was, I know you have the power to do any of these, but I do not wish the name of God to be glorified through me. The only good quality possessed by Ahaz was respect for Isaiah. To avoid his reproaches, Ahaz would disguise himself when he went about, so that the prophet might not recognize him. Only to this circumstance, joined to the fact that he was the father of a pious son and the son of an equally pious father, and in spite of his wickedness, Ahaz is not one of those who have forfeited their portion in the world to come. But he did not escape punishment. On the contrary, his chastisement was severe, not only as a king, but also as a man. In the ill-starred war against Pekah, the king of the northern kingdom, he lost his firstborn son, a great hero. Pekah, however, was not permitted to enjoy the fruits of his victory, for the king of Assyria invaded his empire, captured the golden calf at Dan, and led the tribes on the east side of the Jordan away into exile. The dismemberment of the Israelite kingdom went on for some years. Then the Assyrians, in the reign of Hosea, carried off the second golden calf together with the tribes of Asher, Ishakar, Zebulon, and Naphtali, leaving but one-eighth of the Israelites in their own land. The larger portion of the exiles was taken to Damascus. After that, Israel's doom overtook it with giant strides, and the last ruler of Israel actually hurried the end of his kingdom by a pious deed. After the golden calves had been removed by the Assyrians, Hosea, the king of the north, abolished the stationing of guards on the frontier between Judah and Israel, which prevented pilgrimages to Jerusalem. But the people made no use of this liberty. They perished in their idolatrous cult, and this quickened their punishment. So long as their kings had put obstacles in their path, they could excuse themselves before God for not worshipping him in the true way. The action taken by their king, Hosea, left them no defense. When the Assyrians made their third incursion into Israel, the kingdom of the north was destroyed forever, and the people, one and all, were carried away into exile. The heathen nations settled in Samaria by the Assyrians, instead of the deported ten tribes, were forced by God to accept the true religion of the Jews. Nevertheless, they continued to worship their old idols. The Babylonians paid devotion to a hen, the people of Cutha to a rooster, those of Hamath to a ram, the dog and the ass were the gods of the Avites, and the mule and the horse the gods of the Sepharvites. Next, Hezekiah. 